it is 45 minutes past the hour. I will pass it on to Adrian on the ISO 2022 work stream. Um, Adrian? Okay, fantastic. Um, so uh, we've been working on a, a little POC um, to connect uh, the Banks of TCIB system to a Moduloop system. Um, I'm going to spend most of today talking about the model we're using, um, some design decisions, and really looking for input from the wider community, um, address what I think are some maybe, um, I don't want to say misunderstandings, but uh, uh, potentially differences of uh, understanding of the same thing. Um, only have 20 minutes, uh, so I'll try and get through them and leave, leave some good time for discussion. Uh, the scope of our POC uh, was to bu build a POC adapter between Moduloop and BankServe's TCIB system, uh, evaluate the message mapping, orchestration required, um, document uh, all of that, and then, and then specifically um, try and identify where there may be issues uh, mapping between, you know, an either 222 base system and, and module. Um, Swift run a testing service where we can generate the ISO 222 messages, um, submit those, produce reports and so on. And, and so we plan to do that as well. The, the use case we focused on is person-to-person -person payments. So um, very tightly scoped. Uh, and uh, the context for here is that um, TCIB is, uh, stands for transactions cleared on an immediate basis. It's a, a low value cross-border credit transfer system. Um, it's specifically for the SADC region. Uh, the SADC Banking Association were the initiators of the scheme, I think are the owners of the scheme as well. Um, the operator is BankServe Africa, who are a, a regional clearinghouse, uh, South African domestic clearinghouse, but also do a lot of regional clearing. They have other clearing systems uh, for the region. Um, but most importantly, uh, and, and part of the main reason for this uh, POC is that uh, TCIB is designed to use ISO 222 messaging. Um, it uses a light version of the PAX008 message, which is the uh, um, customer initiated credit transfer message. So, you know, in, in most ISO 222 based systems, that would be how a customer initiates a credit push or what's often just called a credit transfer um, to another customer. And, and what we want to uh, evaluate is um, how do we connect the TCIB system using that message format to the module loop system, uh, which is obviously not using ISO 222 and, and are there any issues? Um, Right up front, uh, and this is where I'm, I'm going to spend a lot of the, the discussion, uh, we have to figure out the design. And, and I think we've gone around and around on this kind of cross-network interoperability question um, quite a bit. Uh, often when we talk about this, we talk about a single entity in the middle there. Um, but we've also uh, had a lot of debate around that and, and acknowledge the fact that, for example, if BankServe is incorporated in South Africa and running out of South Africa and the module system that it's connecting to is in another country, you know, can an entity, let's say, that exists in South Africa be a participant in the module system or vice versa? Um, so that's a, you know, that, that's a question to be answered. Um, the other thing to, uh, to figure out is the incompatibility between the, the messaging flows. So on the, um, the TCIB system as a simple sort of request response, whereas at mod on the module loop side, we know we have you know, a lookup, a quote, a transfer. Uh, and, and so where does orchestration happen when a system receives, uh, in this case, it's a send from TCIB, you receive a um, a message from the TCIB system to initiate a transfer, um, who's responsible for orchestrating all the steps that are required on module loop? Uh, where does that happen? Does it sit um, you know, in the module loop side? Which entity does that? Which component specifically run by which entity does all of that? Um, so historically, we've talked about this idea of cross-network providers, which sort of straddle the two schemes, straddle the two systems. Um, and that's, you know, what the, was the departure point for us was that there would be something along those lines. But I want to drill into the details a little bit more on that and, and um, understand exactly what a cross-network provider 
uh, is and what that means and make sure we're all on the same page. And maybe you can tell me I'm, I'm uh, living in La La Land, but I, I think it's important we have this discussion and, and sort of level set as well. So a quick diversion um, from this project specifically to a question that I've discussed with a few people before and want to make sure I understand clearly what we're talking about um, and give everybody else an opportunity to, uh, to, to say whether they understand the same thing or not. And, and that question is, what does it mean to be a participant in a module loop scheme? Um, is it an entity that can connect to the scheme, connect to the hub and call APIs? Or is it an entity that actually holds money in the system? It has clearing accounts, it participates in the settlement, or is it both or either of those? Um, and, and my understanding um, is that it, it's, it's both or either. So um, give you a moment to sort of digest this, <laughs> this diagram, which is quite busy. Um, but what I'm trying to indicate there is if you have a payer, for example, going through a PISP, uh, the PISP is connecting into the module loop system through the third party APIs. There's back and forth between the DFSPs, lookups, quotes, transfers. Um, the two DFSPs participate in settlement, the PISP doesn't. But I would still consider the PISP a participant in the scheme. Um, they're a different kind of participant. They would be regulated differently. They would probably have a different set of scheme rules that they have to adhere to. Um, and then the parties that are involved here are the payee and the payer. So those are the people whose actual money is being moved back and forth. Um, so in this case, the payer, uh, the little coin on the right is the payer's money sitting at the payer DFSP and the coin on the left is, you know, the account of the payee at the payee DFSP. So even though the transactions initiated through this third party, um, the accounts and the money, uh, that's moving around between accounts is representative of these two parties. Now, the question really then is, what if the payer and the PISP are the same entity? What if the payer is actually a, 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 not a person, but a business, and they are also a registered third party on the system? Um, because in my mind, that's that's always been how I envisioned the, the CNP although um, more, more as an actual DFSP themselves, what the, what, what the uh, third party APIs opened up was this concept of being a participant in the system without needing to be a settlement participant. And I think that's a, a fitting sort of role for a, a cross network provider to play where they're initiating transactions, but they're not necessarily a clearing and settlement participant. Uh, and so I think of the CNP as both a party and participant. So that's kind of setting the stage for where we've ended up on, on our current design and, and, uh, and so on. And, and I can't actually see the chat only on a single screen, but I'll, I'll pick up uh, at the end maybe. Um, unless Simeon, feel free to interrupt me if you think the questions I should address as we go. Um, and so the, the, and the question is, uh, you know, can the, the cross network provider be what we've commonly thought of as a payment initiation service provider. Uh, I think the payment initiation service provider model has mostly been, uh, we've thought of as um, a, an entity that, for example, represents users uh, who have money at, uh, uh, you know, individuals, human beings who have money at a, um, at a DFSP, but want to use the PISP as their, um, to present them with a user experience. So their integration point into the module loop system is through that PISP. So when they initiate a transaction, they do it through the PISP, but the money you know, still sits at the, the DFSP. Um, and my contention is that the uh, somebody who came along and said, well, I wanna be able to send money on the system. It's my own money, but I don't necessarily want to um, use over the top APIs into the DFSP, I wanna go straight into connect directly to the hub, um, could use the third party APIs. And in fact, that's a preferable model because they're standardized and, and um, the access uh, to that system is, um, 
is is uh, available to anyone who qualifies as a, a scheme uh, PISP or third party according to the scheme rules. It's not it's not gated by the DFSPs themselves. Um, so what would happen is the CNP um, joins the scheme, signs the agreements that are necessary to be a, uh, a third party payment uh, API user. They open an account at a DFSP where they deposit money. Now that obviously is reflected that that allows them to now send money on the system by initiating payments through that DFSP. Um, there's a slight variation in, in how the flow works, which I'll talk through. Um, but then they can can initiate those transactions. And and in the uh, PISP or third party API flows, what we have is an initiation message. Um, I think I've got it on the next slide. Uh, and it, the, the purple um, arrows are intended to indicate some of the third party API stuff. Your, your CNP is initiating uh, a transaction through Modulub. This is routed to the DFSP where they hold their actual money. There's the lookup, there's the quote. Following the quote, they get back what would normally be a, a request for authorization of the transaction. So the point when they consent to the transaction, they actually get to see now the outcome of the quoting phase and decide whether to continue. Uh, assuming they do that, uh, then there's the transfer phase. Um, they get the final response, which gives them the outcome of that, and they can ultimately respond to the incoming request from the other network. And so what you have in effect is instead of a, a sort of a single entity, you can uh, think of the CNP as someone who participates in the other network. Maybe they are a clearing participant, even maybe it's a, you know, a bank or a mobile operator um, connected directly to the external network, but then through um, you know, a subsidiary entity or whatever the case may be, they, they become a participant in the Modulub scheme. And my assumption here, and I'm, I'm interested to hear from those that know more, that you would have an easier time joining the Modulub scheme as a third party than as a um, DFSP. Uh, and so it would be easier to do that um, if you were, you know, a financial institution from another country, for example. And so what this kind of looks like, as Miller pointed out when we discussed it, is this is very much sort of the correspondent model where um, this TCIV payee DFSP um, has found a, a, a DFSP on the Modulube system who is kind of their correspondent, and they deposit money there, and they use that to initiate transactions on the Modulube system. Um, but my expectation is that rather than this being DFSP to DFSP relations, which would be kind of more over the top, um, this is a, a cross network provider is likely to be more akin to uh, the, the more modern fintech models we see for cross border like TerraPay uh, or MFS Africa, where they hold money with uh, DFSPs, um, but they're not going through the DFSP to initiate transactions. They're actually going through the scheme. Uh, so there's a subtle a nuanced difference there, which I think is very powerful. Um, so the, the flow here would be that uh, you know, the transactions are coming in over ISO 222 um, into this uh, cross network provider who evaluates that you know, the recipient is actually an account on a module system where they have a third party um, presence. Um, they initiate the payment to that payee. You have all of this back and forth lookup quote and transfer. Uh, during which they get to see what it's going to cost them to deliver that money to the payee, and they uh, consent to that. And we're doing some work with the PISP workstream folks um, to make sure that the consent flow um, allows for something like this. It, it, it would allow, for example, the CMP to have registered a public key with their DFSP um, and be able to sign those consents you know, like that. It doesn't have to be actual an actual human consenting to the transaction. It could be an, a business uh, and a system here that's using you know keys to sign and consent to the quote. Um, and then that's where we see the the adapter that we're building fitting in. It would fit into that model as a piece of software that would be run by the entity connecting into Moduli via the third party APIs, as opposed to connecting into Moduli through the FSP APIs. Um, What's most important there is it, it, or not what's most important, but so I hope you can hear me again. Yes, we can. Go ahead. All right. Let's make sure whatever we build, it's more reliable than Bluetooth. Um, 
So, so uh, I'm trying to remember where I was. So the important, yeah, the important point here was that the uh, module loop transactions are multi-phase, as we all know, which is an important part of, of, of the design. And yet, if we're interfacing with a lot of other systems, especially ISO 222 based systems, they often won't be, they won't have a lookup or a quoting phase. And so we need to uh, simulate that or orchestrate that ourselves um, from whichever component is, is um, initiating the transaction. And the uh, third party uh, APIs provide a nice clean way to do that and offload a lot of that to the DFSP. So what the, the um, TCIB adapter does is it initiates a transaction through those third party APIs and it doesn't have to do anything more um, like lookups or quotes until it gets back the final result of the quote in the, in the consent request. Uh, and if it's happy with that, it just signs it um, and, and sends it back. And then everything else is handled um, by the payer DFSP, makes the, whole, uh, makes the whole integration significantly cleaner. In terms of where we are um, and next steps, um, we didn't have, uh, we didn't put a lot of uh, time on this, unfortunately, the latter part of last year and over the holidays, so we're kind of picking things up again. Um, we did draft an initial tech spec before we started the development work, and that was before we decided to pivot towards trying the um, third party APIs. So we, we need to update the tech spec to use those APIs, but it does have um, some of the message mapping and so on uh, in there already. We've, we've done a bunch of that work, so we need to update that um, to use the new uh, flows. Um, the POC currently handles a golden path, so, so we can take in a message, um, the ISO 222 XML, you know, translate it, map it over to a payment initiation message, uh, send that off, get the response and so on. Um, at the moment, all we've got support for is peer-to-peer -peer payments originated from TCIB. And so next steps will be to um, start thinking about a design for the sending case. So if we were to be sending from a module loop system, um, how would that work? And I think that's going to be particularly challenging because our engagement so far with the uh, team that run the system is that they don't have uh, account lookup or quoting functionality that we could leverage. Um, so there's a lot of work there to figure out um, how you sort of emulate those. If you're going to initiate a transaction from module loop and you need to give the sender a quote, you have to have an idea of what the costs are going to be downstream and you have to be able to, to, to make a best effort, uh, you know, estimate of those. Uh, and we have to give some thought to, about, to, to whether we would even want to support that case um, if we can't be absolutely certain of, of fees. So that's really it. I, I tried to get through quickly because I'm sure there's lots that people want to um, ask or discuss here. Um, so I'm going to switch over to the chat and, and try and address some of those. Um, and Lucien, if you were watching the chat, if there's um, if there's any um, specifics so that I should start with. Yeah. Um, there was a question on discourse from Michael. Um, as PSP yes. as you give us dub double liquidity problem. Uh, the PSP needs to deposit funds with the DFSP to provide its liquidity. Then the DFSP needs also to deposit liquidity cover with the scheme to provide its liquidity. Uh, if I understand the question correctly, um, you were talking about the, the cost of capital and adding adding cost to the system. Um, so, yeah, the 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 um, the cross network provider does effectively have to prepay for any payments it's going to send. Um, but those deposits at the DFSP are effectively what is covering the DFSP's cover at the um, at the uh, at the center. So I, I would have to think a bit more carefully about that, Michael, or understand uh, the cost of capital impact there, if that is what you're asking about. Awesome, um, Adrian. I'm gonna. Um... I think we should wrap up here. Uh, there are some okay, I'll, I'll pick up the questions in this course. Um, thanks, sorry, it was, it was just a quick one to sort of put out there what our thinking is and I, and I appreciate feedback because I, I, I don't want us to continue down this track if folks think this model is, is not workable. Awesome, thanks so much. Great, Adrian. thanks Amin, all right, cheers. Um, um, again, for the interesting conversations, if uh, I'd encourage you all to those into discourse, just so we have a permanent record of these conversations and 
um, can build some community around the direction we want to go. Um, again, Adrian, thank you so much for your presentation.